Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Hesperosaurus, as well as some dinosaur news. But first, we're really excited that this is our 50th episode and that we've already made it up to 50 after just launching in January of this year. We're recording on the Saturday before this will go live, but we just reached our 100,000th download, so we're also really excited about that. Yeah. Also, we just got another Patreon supporter, so thank you so much. It's good to keep the momentum going. If any of you listening out there want to support us through our Patreon page, please check us out at patreon.com slash inodino, and Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. All right, so I'll jump right into the news here. First is an article out of Pier J titled, What do giant titanosaur dinosaurs and modern Australasian megapods have in common? And it was written by E. Martin Heckenleitner. And if you're not familiar with megapods, like I wasn't, because I'm not as knowledgeable about birds, about living birds, I should say, <laughs> as I am about dinosaurs, they're birds that are also known as incubator birds or mound builders, and that kind of gives you a bit of a hint about what they discovered. So there was previous research that had shown that titanosaurs reproduced at nesting sites, meaning they would find several nests kind of close together, and could show some kind of social behavior, or it might mean that there was something about that site that made it particularly advantageous for titanosaurs to congregate there. But none of the previous research really discussed how they selected those nesting sites or why they might have chosen them. So because titanosaurs inhabited every continent on the Earth, including Antarctica, there are several known nesting sites all over the place. And the researchers investigated all the known Cretaceous titanosaur nesting sites, including three in Europe, two in Argentina, and one in India. And they were trying to find out if they buried their eggs or if they left them in open nests or some other kind of behavior. So what they found was that the different sites, which also represented different species of titanosaurs, showed an array of nesting strategies which were similar to those megapods. So they believe that many of the eggs were likely incubated with relatively high humidity, and they can kind of discern that by looking at the geometry of the pores that are in the eggshell. So we don't really think about it too much, but when you have a fetus inside an egg, it still has to breathe. So in humans, the baby gets all of its air through its bloodstream that comes from the mom, and it just absorbs it, you know, the mom absorbs it in the blood, and then it goes to the baby through the umbilical cord, and then the baby gets the oxygen. But in a egg, obviously you're not connected to something that's breathing. So what you have to have is pores in the eggshell so that the oxygen can diffuse into the egg. And then the fetus gets its oxygen that way. So depending on what the conditions are, the pores of that egg need to change in order to get enough oxygen into the egg. So... In this case, they looked at the different eggs and they could kind of figure out what kind of temperature it was at or what the humidity was. It's pretty clever. Based on that humidity and the arrangement of the eggs that were around in these nesting sites, it can tell them whether they were covered in a mound or if they were buried. And just like the modern birds that they're comparing to, they may have buried a little bit of compost with the eggs, and then as the compost decomposes, it would keep the eggs warm. But then it looks like some of the other eggs were buried near naturally occurring hot geological features, making the dinosaurs, quote, opportunistic geothermal incubators. <laughs> so basically they would take advantage of geothermal and hydrothermal activity, and that way you don't have to worry about adding compost or building a big heap over. You could just dig a little hole near something warm. There are some cool pictures online if you look up these megapods, or maybe they're pronounced megapodes. I'm not as familiar with living birds <laughs> as dinosaurs. But it's kind of cool. Some of the mounds that these birds make, it'll be a fairly small bird that'll make like a six-foot-tall mound full of like compost and then cover a bunch of sand on top of it and stuff. They're pretty elaborate structures compared to just the little ones that you see in like Land Before Time or something where it's basically just a little carved-out bowl in the surface of the ground. 
just to jump in, in the land before time, we didn't see any titanosaur nests, just sauropod nests. So. Good point. Next in the news, we mentioned a couple items that came out of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting in Dallas, Texas in last week's episode. And here's another item that came out. Paleontologist Michael Habib presented on how sauropods pumped enough blood up their necks to their brains. He said that a titanosaur from New Mexico with a well-preserved neck had spines called cervical ribs. These were about six feet long. And these were like springy bones. And when sauropods walked, these springs helped them keep their neck steady instead of swaying back and forth. Based on fossils and living animals, he concluded that when, quote, the cervical ribs flexed, they would have compressed towards the neck and the muscle would have pushed on air sacs wrapped around the vertebral artery. This is according to a Smithsonian Magazine article. And it would have acted like a pump to the heart. So whenever a sauropod moved its neck, it would have helped to pump blood. And that means that it would have actually had a more normal-sized heart, not a giant heart necessarily, or any additional special organs that might have helped to keep the blood flowing. So that could potentially solve the mystery of how these giant, kind of outrageous-looking animals <laughs> were able to live. Another article that was published online this time in Taylor and Francis Online, and I don't think we've spoken about any articles from there before. This one's titled, Theropod Dinosaur Ichnogenus Hispanosauropus Identified from the Morrison Formation, parentheses, Upper Jurassic, in Western North America. And it was written by John R. Foster. I like the title in National Geographic a little better, which was, Limping with Dinosaurs. Partly because it's kind of a pun on walking with dinosaurs, which we both enjoyed a lot. And also because it gives you a good idea of what he's going to talk about. So the Morrison Formation in eastern Utah in the U.S., we've talked about that area before. And there is a trackway there of theropod footprints. Specifically, the two feet of the theropod. And it appears that the three-toed dinosaur was walking with one side having slightly shorter strides than the other side, and researchers are thinking that it might be limping. So the dinosaur might have been going about four or five miles an hour, or about seven kilometers an hour, and the fossil tracks have been described in the past. This isn't something that's brand new. And it was described under the Ichno genus, which you might remember from our discussion about ichnology, means that it was just based on the remnants that an animal left behind, in this case a trackway, so it's not based on an actual part of the animal. And it was named Hispanosauropus, and you can probably tell that based on the name, it's from Europe, specifically the Iberian Peninsula, along with Spain, thus the Hispan part of the name. So the specific area in Utah that they're talking about is called Copper Ridge, and also in the other tracks that were in Europe, there were three large theropod dinosaurs that could have made the tracks. And those are a spinosaurid, a ceratosaurid, or an allosaurid theropod. John Foster believes that it was most likely an allosaurid theropod, partly because its foot fossil seems to compare well with the print, but also because it was the most common of those dinosaurs in the area. And National Geographic points out that multiple allosaurus skeletons, including Big Al, Big Al II, and the National Museum of Natural History specimen show multiple injuries ranging from infected toe bones to broken ribs. So injuries for Allosaurus probably weren't that uncommon, so it's kind of a link to why this one might have been limping. I love looking at all these dinosaur footprints, and on our website we have a little map, and it shows a few areas where you can check out some dinosaur footprints in the U.S., and hopefully I'll be able to add to that map and expand to the rest of the world in the near future. There was a new study presented at the Geological Society of America annual meeting in Wyoming that found that T. rexes may have been cannibals. This is based on fossils found in the Lance Formation in Wyoming. These bones that they found had deep grooves, like from a large animal, and teeth marks with ragged edges, like a T. rex's. There have been other studies that have suggested that T. rex was a cannibal, Studies from 2007 and 2010 found that tyrannosaurs used their neck muscles to swallow animals whole, up to 110 pounds, and strip off flesh with its jaws. Also, T. rex coprolites have been found where one-third of the mass of the coprolite was made up of broken pieces of bone, which suggests that T. rex had a fast metabolism. So, maybe they were cannibals, maybe there's another explanation, but one thing is certain is that T. rex ate 
very often in order to live due to their fast metabolism and also seems like they had no patience to chew. <laughs> <laughs> then we have one last article about dinosaurs this week. This one's titled A Densely Feathered Ornithomimid Dinosauria Theropoda from the Upper Cretaceous Dinosaur Park Formation in Alberta, Canada. And it was published in the journal Cretaceous Research, which you can get the abstract online, but it's going to be printed in the March 2016 edition. It was written by Aaron van der Reest and others, including Philip J. Curry, who we spoke with back in episode four. The area specifically is the Upper Cretaceous Dinosaur Park Formation, which is inside the Dinosaur Provincial Park, which is in Alberta, which is in Canada. <laughs> and it was found back in 2009, but they're kind of just getting around to explaining it. So according to the abstract, it's the first ornithomimid to preserve a tail bearing extensive plumaceous feathers that are slightly more elongate in comparison to those present on the remainder of the body. And they describe the plumage pattern as being similar to the modern ostrich and other large paleonaths, which is a family of birds that includes the emu and the cassowary as well. I hadn't looked at all of them together before researching this article, but they all have pretty much the exact same feather pattern, which is kind of a big puff ball of feathers, and then legs and feet with basically no feathers and a big weird neck with no feathers. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe that's how I should describe dinosaurs, big puff balls. Yeah. <laughs> Van der Reest said, it's pretty remarkable. I don't know if I've stopped smiling since excavating it. We now know what the plumage looked like on the tail, and that from the mid-femur down it had bare skin. So they believe that the plumage pattern, including only light feathers on its neck, shows that it used its feathers for thermoregulation. And that's been the theory for a long time with these modern birds that we mentioned, if they have some exposed skin and other areas are covered in feathers, that helps them keep cool or keep warm. So the feathers on the specimen had been crushed by the fossilization process, but they managed to use a scanning electron microscope to examine them, and then they saw the keratin structure characteristic of the feathers. So that's how they identified them. They also found that there was skin spanning the gap that started halfway down the thigh and stretched up to the dinosaur's abdomen, which is just like in modern birds, except that in modern birds, the skin goes all the way down to the knee instead of just halfway down, which is further evidence that birds likely evolved from theropods like ornithomimus. This discovery makes the third feathered ornithomimid specimen found in the world, and the first that also had a well-preserved tail. So, very important specimen, and it's really cool to see how similar it was to modern birds, and it kind of makes you think like well maybe a lot of these ornithomimids basically just looked like a big old ostrich which i still think would have been terrifying <laughs> since we went to an ostrich farm a few years back and it was very intimidating to feed them yeah sabrina couldn't really handle it but she's generally afraid of birds so well like a eight foot tall or however tall those things are bird was not i don't have a great track record with bird <laughs> A seagull stole my lunch from my hand once, <laughs> and another bird, just for fun, landed on my head for a second and then kind of clawed at it. Yeah, it's amazing that you like dinosaurs as much as you do, since they were also birds. I'm sure I'd be really scared if dinosaurs were alive, although it would be awesome. Yeah, I'm torn. <laughs> <laughs> but quick shout out, thanks to Phil who gave us a link to one of the articles about the ornithomimus on Facebook. Next in the news, an adolescent pentaceratops bones were lifted via military helicopter from New Mexico's Beastie Wilderness area to the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. The skull alone weighed 4,500 pounds, and normally they would just do this via regular vehicle, but the reason they used the helicopters is because the fossils were found in an area where cars were not allowed to drive, and visitors should be able to see the pentaceratops early this month. In somewhat related news, there's a food artist, Sarah Hardy, who's selling chocolate dinosaur teeth fossils, which actually look really realistic. Right now she's got a T-Rex tooth chocolate fossil. It's made from Ecuadorian milk chocolate, and she also sells a dark chocolate megalodon tooth. And I'm not sure, maybe I know a little bit too much about T-Rex teeth, but I would feel a little weird eating one 
because it looks so realistic, even though I know it's chocolate, because I would be thinking the whole time about its septic bite. So T-Rex supposedly had a septic bite because there's so much bacteria growing in its mouth that when it bit, maybe somehow you did survive, but then the bacteria would get you and you would die anyway. Kind of like a Komodo dragon? Possibly. Hopefully she doesn't infuse her chocolate with <laughs> flesh-eating bacteria. <laughs> I doubt she does, but it does look very realistic. Mm. <laughs> Next, we've discussed this before, but io9 recently published an interview with the writers of Marvel's newest comic, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. They consider it the quote-unquote ultimate buddy comic, and it's about a genius 10-year-old girl just trying to fit in in New York, or a city like New York. She also has inhuman DNA, and she's looking to find a way to stop a mutant bomb that's mutating people in her city. And in doing so, she accidentally transports Devil Dinosaur from the past, and then the two become buddies. Apparently, Marvel was eager to revive the character Devil Dinosaur, and the original series involved a moon boy, not a moon girl, and the writers addressed this in the first issue. And there's also already tentative plans for crossovers with other Marvel characters, so I'm looking forward to that. Another interesting tidbit about Jurassic World, it turns out that Chris Pratt, more accurately his character Owen Grady, learned how to interact with the raptors based on a man named Randy Miller, who lives in a mountain compound near tigers, lions, cougars, leopards, and bears. Oh my. And Randy has been staging animal attacks for various media for the last 20 years. Commercials, movies, TV shows. He went to a stunt school at a young age, and then he made a fortune selling his great-grandfather's seltzer and flavored syrup, which he and his father named Original New York Seltzer. He, with his wealth, bought a lot of lions and tigers and other animals, and he even took his tigers to the office sometimes. And he did his own stunts in the ads for the original New York seltzer. An article in The Guardian covers his life in a lot more detail, but basically Chris Pratt learned how to deal with animals from Randy Miller, and his posture in the movie and even the use of a clicker with the raptors was based on what Randy taught Chris. Chris Pratt talks a little bit about that in the special features in the DVD and Blu-ray about Jurassic World. Yeah, and on to the next big movie, The Good Dinosaur. It's coming out in theaters later this month, but the story behind the movie is pretty interesting. It was scheduled for release last year, but then in mid-2013, the director Bob Peterson was removed and the voice cast was replaced, most if not all of them. According to Pixar, the current director, Pete Sohn, has basically been co-director, so he took over when Bob Peterson got stuck. And for the record, Bob still works at Pixar. Everybody's still happy with him. It just, I guess he just got stuck with where the story was going. So the movie everyone will see is this boy and his dog type story, where the boy's the dinosaur Arlo and the dog is a boy named Spot. And the reason the voice cast changed is because the characters became younger. Originally, Arlo was supposed to be 17, but now he's only 11, and his siblings are also younger. And a number of characters were also cut to simplify the story. The original story had three storylines that couldn't really be wrapped up by the end of the movie. And in the end, they decided to focus on one of the storylines, and then they completely started over. They had new locations, new sets, and decided to focus on the characters that they kept. They made it pretty emotional. There's not much dialogue, and it's set in a really immersive environment. And they also weave in some science, such as raptors with feathers, so we'll be looking out for that come the end of this month. Yeah, for most of the trailers, it looked like they were very smooth and typical animation cartoon style, so it'll be interesting to see how they do feathers. Yeah, there's a couple of sites with stills that show some dinosaurs with feathers, but I don't know how much it's incorporated. Yeah, and we've talked about it too. Some of the dinosaurs are going to look a little weird because they decided, well, the dinosaurs never went extinct, so they kept evolving. Hmm. It'll be good to see all that. And last in the news, I recently started a new job. I have some awesome new coworkers, and they shared with me a Google map that someone made that highlights where you can find dinosaurs and other prehistoric fossils based on the country they've been found and state. And we'll post a link on our blog if you have some time to click around. It's pretty entertaining. That wraps up the news. Now on to the dinosaur of the day, Hesperosaurus, whose name means western lizard. Hesperosaurus lived in the Jurassic. The first fossils were found in 1985 in Wyoming, and Patrick McSherry, a fossil hunter, found the fossils on a ranch in Wyoming, but he had some trouble digging up the bones due to the hard rock, so he got some help from Ronald G. Moose and Jeff Parker from the Western Paleontological Laboratories. They also worked with D. Hall, a paleontologist from Brigham Young University. 
At first, they thought the bones were Stegosaurus, but Clifford Miles, who prepared the fossils, found that they were a new species. And so the type species name is Hesperosaurus musi, named in 2001. It was described in 2001 by Kenneth Carpenter, Clifford Miles, and Karen Cloward. Its name means Western because it was found in the Western United States, and it's named Moose to honor Ronald Moose, who also had a cast made, which you can see in the Denver Museum of Natural History. In 2001, this holotype was the oldest known stegosaur in America. The holotype included a nearly complete skull and most of the body, 13 neck vertebrae, 13 back vertebrae, 44 tail vertebrae, neck ribs, dorsal ribs, chevrons, pelvis, ossified tendons, and 10 neck and back plates that formed two rows. Based on healed fractures, the holotype was an old Hesperosaurus individual. It's part of the Stegosaur family, but one of the older Stegosaurs in the Morrison Formation. It's a close relative of Stegosaurus, and like Stegosaurus, it had two rows, probably alternating plates of it on its back and four spikes on its tail called phagomizers, informally. And we've talked about that in depth in episode 38. But the story behind that name is that Gary Larson who made the Far Side cartoon, published in 1982 a cartoon showing cavemen calling the spikes thagomizers, and the official line was, now this end is called the thagomizer, after the late Thag Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> the Sparasaurus plates were not as tall as Stegosaurus, but they were possibly longer. The skull was also deeper than Stegosaurus. Kenneth Carpenter originally said Hesperosaurus was a basal stegosaur, but in 2008, Susanna Maidman and colleagues published a study that showed it was a derived form and a close relative of Stegosaurus and Wuhersaurus. They said it should be considered to be a species of Stegosaurus, and they wanted to call it Stegosaurus musi instead of Hesperosaurus musi, and then they renamed Wuhersaurus to Stegosaurus homeni. But this is controversial, and not everyone agrees. Carpenter and Christensen both separately rejected this idea in 2010, saying Hesperosaurus was different enough to be its own genus. Carpenter disagreed because he thought that the type species of Stegosaurus, Stegosaurus armatus, was a gnomum dubium, and he rejected lumping all Stegosaurus fossils from North America into one species. He also thought that Stegosaurus stenops was a separate species and compared Hesperosaurus to Stegosaurus stenops. The differences he found included that Hesperosaurus had a large antiorbital fenestra, a short and deep maxilla, 13 neck vertebrae instead of 10, 13 dorsal or back vertebrae instead of 17, and oval-shaped plates instead of triangular plates. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. In a different episode, we talked about the triangular versus round plates possibly meaning different genders. So it sounds like there's a, still quite a bit of research that needs to be done there. Yeah. Published descriptions of Hesperosaurus vary, though, due to different interpretations. The plate shape may be different due to erosion. The different numbers of vertebrae may be due to whether some of the vertebrae should be part of the neck or back. In 2012, an histological study found that Hesperosaurus osteoderms were the same as those in Stegosaurus. CAT scans showed the plates were having thin, dense outer walls with spongy bone inside, and the spikes had thicker walls and spongy interiors with a single large blood vessel. In 2010, a study on the soft, visible parts of a specimen nicknamed Victoria, which I'll get into a little more detail in a second, found the first proof that a stegosaur had a horn sheath on the plates, which may mean the plates were used for defense, since the horn sheath would have strengthened the plate and given it sharp cutting edges. It also reinforces the display theory because the sheath increased the plate's visible surface, and sheaths are usually brightly colored. But if it had those sheaths on, obviously it would have been more difficult to thermoregulate using them. Yeah, and this is because the horn sheath provides another insulating layer and it has a smooth surface, but modern cattle and ducks actually use their horns and beaks to help cool down, even though they do have these horn sheath things. Several pretty complete skeletons of Hesperosaurus have been found. Since 1995, Hans Jacob Sieber, a Swiss paleontologist, excavated Stegosaurus specimens in Wyoming, and as of 2001, three other Hesperosaurus specimens have been found there. At first, they were thought to be Stegosaurus. There was Moritz, found in 1995, a partial skeleton. Victoria, also found in 1995, so there's Victoria again. But Victoria was not reclassified to Hesperosaurus until 2010 by Nikolai Christensen. Interestingly, Victoria has skin and horn sheath impressions as well as a mostly complete skull. And there's also Lily, found in 2002 and named after the sisters Nicola and Rebea Lilik, who volunteered to help excavate. All three are now part of the Ethel Dinosaur Museum collection in Switzerland, although not all of them have yet been formally described. Nikolai Christensen and Emanuel Schopp described Victoria, though, found in the Howe Stevens Quarry, where other soft tissue impressions have been found. 
When Victoria died, she was partially buried and then completely buried by a second flow of sediment, preserving elements on her right side. They had enough soft tissue impression to show a honeycomb scale pattern on skin. She's also seen in hadrosaurs and one other stegosaur from Asia. The scale pattern is not uniform, but is different depending on the part of the body. So there's larger dome scales surrounded by smaller ones on its back. They concluded that there is a plate slash horn sheath based on it having a smooth plate with shallow grooves, though it's not 100% confirmed. In 2015, more Hesperosaurus specimens were found, at least five in Montana, and these specimens showed that Hesperosaurus, which, again, because of the controversy, sometimes is referred to as Stegosaurus musai. And I think we might have even called it Stegosaurus musai in our episode that was on Stegosaurus. Yeah, we did. <laughs> this is before we researched Hesperosaurus. So. Well, I mean, it's still controversial, so. It, it is. And this is what Garrett was talking about. It showed sexual dimorphism. Evan Thomas Seta published a study that showed that there were two types of plates. The paper is called Evidence for Sexual Dimorphism in the Plated Dinosaur Stegosaurus Mosai, Ornithischia Stegosauria, from the Morrison Formation, Upper Jurassic of Western USA, published April 22nd in PLOS One. To sum up, specimens were found with two types of plates, large and round versus tall and spiky, and they were found to be not different species, but different genders. And Evan, the lead author, said the large wide plates were probably from males for display, and the tall spiky ones were from females used as deterrents. They were found together, which shows they probably coexisted, and the plates had similar growth rings, so the dinosaurs were around the same age, and that shows that it's not that the plates changed with age. But back to a more general description of Hesperosaurus, Hesperosaurus was about 20 to 23 feet or 6 to 7 meters long and weighed 2 to 3 tons. It had a short wide head and 20 maxillary teeth, which is fewer than Stegosaurus, though similar. In 2007, Peter Malcolm Galton wrote that Hesperosaurus teeth were different due to having rough vertical ridges on the upper part of the crown and weakly developed fine grooves on the tooth surface. Even though its teeth may have been a little bit different from Stegosaurus, it was still an herbivore. It probably ate moss, cycads, conifers, ferns, and horsetails. Though it's not necessarily Stegosaurus, it is a type of Stegosaur, and Stegosaurs were first around in Asia in the middle to late Jurassic, and then they migrated to North America a few million years later. Predators of Hesperosaurus included Ceratosaurus and Allosaurus. Some scientists think that Hesperosaurus is actually more closely related to a Stegosaur from Europe called Decentrurus instead of Stegosaurus. Stegosauridae is a family that lived in the Jurassic and also the Cretaceous. They have rows of osteoderms, or plates, and thagomizers on their tails. And these plates may have been used for display, defense, and or thermal regulation. They were slow because their front legs were shorter than their rear legs, but they were still large and powerful. There are two subfamilies, Decentrorinae and Stegosaurinae. Stegosaurinae tended to be larger. The earliest one is Lexoviosaurus from England and Decentrorinae have long back, spines, and necks. Decentrorinae includes Decentrorus, and Stegosaurus more closely related to Decentrorus than Stegosaurus, such as Hesperosaurus. And our fun fact of the day, I'm stealing from Taylor McCoy. Who we've interviewed on our podcast, so thanks, Taylor. He's the founder of Everything Dinosaurs, the website. Yeah, and what he posted is a really good point, which is most people probably don't think about with dinosaurs, but... They hold the record for the fastest animal ever, and not the really quick ornithomimids, which are really fast, but he's talking about the peregrine falcon, which could go about 240 miles an hour, or almost 400 kilometers an hour. So there you go. Fastest animal ever is a dinosaur. <laughs> Yay, go dinosaurs! And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And again, if you want to check out our Patreon page, please go to patreon.com slash I Know Dino. And that's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And thanks for all the support. We're really excited to have reached 100,000 total downloads and made it to our 50th episode. Yeah, big accomplishments. We're really excited and grateful to all our listeners. So thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.